number of patients and uh, duration of the study? Yeah, sure. So our our goal is to meet with the FDA this year. If we get readout in June, uh, we should be able to pull the package together and, and submit an end of phase two request to the FDA. And that's our target is to do that this year. Um, then part of that part of that uh, proposal would be the proposal to conduct a phase three in chronic. We still are conducting the study in subacute, but if we have positive data in chronic, our regulatory consultants are saying, don't wait, take the chronic data, go to the FDA, continue on with the subacute as a confirmatory study. Uh, that will just answer if we treat earlier in the disease process, does uh, one cohort work better than the other? But if we have positive and chronic, we'll meet with the FDA uh, at the end of this year. Uh, we'll, the designs that we're planning right now are roughly 200 patients, you know, 20 to 30 centers across the US. We'll pick a functional endpoint. Uh, and the goal would be to kick that off and get that off the ground in the first first quarter, first half of next year. Okay. And then uh, looking out beyond that, uh, when would you expect that that study to read out and, and potentially file? Yeah. Yeah, well, our, our plans right now are to uh, submit an NDA in 2028. You know, that's the goal. Um, it really is going to be heavily dependent upon enrollment. Um, we think that, you know, if, if we show positive results here, it shouldn't be too challenging to get folks into a larger phase three. If we have roughly 20 to 30 centers across the U.S. and we need 200 patients, um, you know, we just we just did 20 patients at Shirley Ryan in a little over a year. So, um, you know, folks could do the math and figure out how quickly we can get this uh, study done. Uh, then it's a matter of pulling all of the package together. Uh, we we hired a head of tech ops last year who's got our CMC world wired because most companies of our stage, that's where they fall down. Uh, and that, and and we we brought in an expert who is now manufacturing and working on our plans for manufacturing the future. We have teed up all of our plans to continue all of our tox work uh, so that we can put that into the package as well, as well as what I mentioned earlier, we're still doing a lot of preclinical work to understand the specific molecular mechanism. And all of that is gonna plan on going into the package that we'll submit to the FDA. Uh, so the team is working on all fronts to be prepared to submit an NDA in 2028, but obviously there's a lot of assumptions that go into that timing. Okay, so assuming that you filed for regulatory approval in 2028, you could potentially be commercially available on the market in four years or so from now. That's the plan. All right. That's the plan, yeah, and I'm, I, that's, you know, that's what excited me the most about joining this organization. You know, I know the size of, commercial organization we need to build here. Uh, I've built commercial organizations that are much larger than what we need to launch this product. Um, and, and I think, you know, a small company like ours can actually hit these timelines and get this done very quickly. So that's, that's what excites everybody who's joined this organization. Okay. How many sales professionals would you need to commercialize 291? Yeah, I think you probably only need like 25 sales reps across the U.S. I mean, these these folks find their ways to the traumatic experts who treat uh, spinal cord injury, right? And and if you can target those experts, which you know are 25 to 35 centers across the United States, uh, you're going to be hitting majority of the market and majority of cases. And so we're using that plan to actually target for our, our clinical phase three program. Uh, so most of these folks are going to be familiar with the drug by the time we launch it. Um, and you know, this is uh, not that sales forces aren't important, but this is a this will be you know a, upon successful data, this will be a breakthrough in medicine that will be a pretty simple PR campaign as combined with a a sales organization and a market access team that could really help explain to payers uh, the importance of paying for something like this. You know, we have we have all of that, you know, going for us as well as, you know, we're linked to a lot of the patient advocacy groups that are in this area. Um, 
they're all cheering for us. You know, we we work for them. Wings for Life has been fantastic. They've actually are funding a third of our current clinical trial, uh, and and you know they're doing great work. Uh, we've we've partnered and with educational initiatives with the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. You know, so so there's a lot of it's a very small community and a very small patient population uh, and a huge unmet medical need. All right. Well, it sounds like you've done a lot of the groundwork already and, and potentially this is relatively manageable independently by nerve gen. You don't need a, a, a partner necessarily. Is that, is that a correct assessment? Yeah, I don't think we need a partner to, to, you know, access uh, spinal cord injury. We we will need a partner to look at some of the bigger indications that this product could potentially uh, work on. You know, that's one of the reasons we're looking uh, at MVG 300, which is our next generation um, molecule that's in preclinical development, and we're studying stroke and ALS. Um, now we would, you know, that's where you know we need some big money to look at other different disease states. You know, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's. Uh, stroke, those are big, big markets, big clinical programs. So we, we, I, we're in discussions with a lot of different bigger partners on those types of uh, indications. We're also in, in discussions with folks who are interested in spinal cord injury. But you know, our, our plan is, you know, raise capital uh, and and continue executing our plan. Uh, if a partner comes in and can do something faster um, and get it to patients sooner you know, then we'll have discussions. Okay, makes sense. And then what about outside the US or out, outside North America, I should say? Yeah, we've, we, uh, we're, right now we're resource constrained. Um, we have looked at Europe. Uh, obviously our phase three will include Canada and the US, uh, but we've looked at Europe and we've talked about, um, we've talked to several different groups in Europe as well as uh, Asia. Um, we. We, we're not sure right now whether we want a regionalized partner uh, or whether we want a global partner on, on an indication perspective, um, but all of that's on the table. And a lot of it, I think, will be accelerated once we have this data readout and once folks see that now we're past the proof of concept stage in humans, uh, those partnership discussions will go from, you know, d from dancing to uh, maybe uh, some type of wedding. Okay. All right. Um, so maybe shifting gears over to the financial side of the business, um, can you just talk about NerveGen's cash burn? Yeah. So our last reported um, September, we had fifteen million dollars in cash in the U U.S. dollars. Um, we're burning just a little over, you know, a million dollars a month. So that takes us through twenty twenty five. Uh, we know that we're going to have to do a raise to execute our, our plans moving forward. Uh, so Bill Adams and I, who's CFO, have been on the road talking to many in, uh, many investors. This this company has taken a, a pretty interesting path. It's not your typical venture backed U.S. biotech. Uh, we the company went very went public very early in its life cycle. Um, Harold Punit, who's the founder, uh, you know Harold actually met with Jerry Silver and in licensed the technology out of Case Western uh, and a group of investors in Vancouver and uh, Harold took the company public. Um, in, 20, in 2016 or 2017, he founded the company. Uh, so it was a different path than most US investors are used to. Um, but the Canadian markets have been very, very kind to us and we have a huge following in the retail uh, setting. Uh, we also have several in institutional investors in Canada that have jumped in and, and we did a raise last year of $20 million, $23 million Canadian bought deal, uh, which really helped us get to this point. Uh, but we know moving forward, we're gonna have to rely on um, typically, you know, more retail as well as institutional investors. Um, and that's why, you know, Bill and I are on the road talking to as many people as we can, telling them the story to get our name in front of folks because we're not a well-known entity in the U.S. markets right now. Okay, great. That That's super helpful background. And then I guess as you look look ahead to, I guess, how, how far does your 
current cash runway expend, and then you have some potentially significant expenses ahead for a phase. Yeah, year. we have enough cash to get us through a minimum this year into next year. Um, and we'll have, you know, the MVG 300 readout this quarter, uh, the MVG 291 proof of concept in humans, spinal cord injury next quarter. Um, so we we think post data announcement, we're, we're gonna be in a good position to um, top off of our treasury, but obviously, you know, development companies are always raising money. Uh, we're always raising money um, and we, you know, we always find investors and investors are finding us now. Um, it was a bit of a, it was very tough slogging early on, uh, but now that we're getting close to a, a readout, uh, our phone is ringing rather than us picking up the phone calling folks. Okay. Um, do you, uh, I guess, I think you mentioned this briefly, but um, just a rough idea of how much the phase three study would cost. Yeah, the phase three study, we're, we're estimating that the phase three study specifically will cost, you know, roughly $45 million, some in, somewhere in that range. Um, you know, if we want to advance MVG 300, obviously, you know, you look at the typical IND enabling studies, you know, you need several million dollars for those as well. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we can't forget about technical operations, manufacturing, and making sure that we're wired for all of those things. So, we think you know the the number to get us to an NDA, you could probably take that forty five million and double it, and that gets us to the NDA point. Um, but you know we're we're uh, we're in a pretty good position, I think, right now with with our capital. You know we don't need money at this stage, but you know we will be in a position where we do need money when we when we get this readout and we want to sit down with the FDA to conduct an end of phase two meeting and design that phase three. Okay, makes sense. Now, uh, you've mentioned NVG 300, uh, your plans are to go into ALS and stroke. Can you just talk a little bit about the background of, of NVG 300? Yeah, we've kind of kept NVG 300 and we're gonna continue to keep it a little bit close to the vest because it's, uh, it's, it's an internally discovered um, molecule. It'll qualify, uh, you know, it, it'll be a biologic um, and you know, right now we've conducted one um, spinal cord injury study last year. It was successful, so we're doing a confirmatory spinal cord injury study. Uh, but we're branching off and looking at stroke and ALS because um, we don't necessarily need a backup in, in spinal cord injury. We need to explore new fertile ground in the neuroreparative space. So that's why we picked stroke and ALS. But yeah, we, we um, will announce the data. Um, sometime this quarter uh, in stroke and ALS. And I think that'll that'll really kind of be the catalyst, the coming out party for MVG 300. But like any other development company in a small company like ours, you got to keep it close to the vest from a competitive perspective, but you got to show a little bit to the investment community so that they can fund it. Uh, and that's kind of the position we're in right now. Um, but we feel strong. We've we filed all the patents around it and we're we're, we're going to be in a very strong position as we announce data here uh, towards the end of Q1. All right, excellent. Well, we'll look forward to learning more about NVG 300. And then I guess just near term next steps for NVG 291. Near term next steps is this data readout. I mean, we're all, all you know, we, we just announced our first patient in for subacute. So near term, we'll be operationalizing getting patients into the subacute cohort. Um, we're well on our way. Um, we're, we're, we've got a significant amendment passed uh, through IRB last year, which loosened the entry criteria a little bit, um, which basically made the window between 20 and 90 days post-injury, which helps. Now we can get people inpatient as well as people who are leaving inpatient going to outpatient rehab and Obviously, Shirley Ryan is a very large attractant to outpatient rehab. Um, so we're going to continue to advance subacute. Uh, from a chronic perspective, uh, it's just a matter of now making sure that our data management team uh, is wired. Uh, and they've been meeting daily, I can tell you, to make sure that when the last data, when the last data point, uh, last day of the last patient in is complete, 
uh, majority of the data is already in the database. And so we have a very short window between that point in time 